Uh, when I was a senior in high school, I broke my shoulder skiing, of all uh, places, trying to impress a girl. <laughs> Actually, the, uh, the longer story goes, I was a senior in high school, there was a girl um, who I just was madly had a crush on, and her name was Barbie, of all names, so how <laughs> perfect is this name? And uh, we were going um, skiing with the, with the church group. I had been skiing on the hills of North Dakota. That was my experience. <laughs> and uh, she had skied Colorado for the past several years. And so I found out she was going on the trip. So I thought I would go, assuming this would be my chance to uh, impress her. So we get there, and uh, we go skiing the very first day, and they offer a little training course for anyone who's never skied before to learn on the bunny hill, which I got to the bunny hill, and it's steeper than any hill in North Dakota. Okay. Um, Denver skiing, there's nothing quite like skiing in Colorado. So I take the morning, and I'm, I'm learning how to ski, and, you know, make your um, french fries go forward, and your pizza slice to slow down. And, I got I can pretty much get to the bottom without falling uh, by lunchtime. So I go to lunch in the lodge with all the other newbies. And as I'm at lunch, uh, Barbie and her group of older friends comes in for lunch. And they're sitting not too far away. So I mosey on over to the table. And I ask them where they were going to go skiing in the afternoon and if I could come. And they're like, are you sure? I'm like, I think I made it all the way down. Uh, they said, sure, let's, uh, why don't you come with us? So I'm like, sweet, here we go, I'm, uh, I'm in. <laughs> uh, we go skiing, uh, we go up to the top of this lift, and we decided that we're going to go down this blue run, so green is the easiest, blue, and then black is the hardest. It's a blue run, and it has moguls on it, so moguls are the bumps that they do on television. And I, for I forget the name of the... I think it was called The Widowmaker. I can't remember, <laughs> remember the run's name exactly. But I'm like, OK, well, let's go. So I begin going down this blue run my first afternoon of skiing. And of course, I fall down about four or five times. I just kind of scoot the bottom the rest of the way on my butt. And I get to the bottom, and they're all waiting for me. And I said, so where are we going next? And they said, well, we're going to do it again. I'm like, OK, let's, uh, let's go. So again, same run, about four or five times I fall. I'm like, where are you going now? Like, we're doing it again. I'm like, okay, I, I think I get this time. This third time down this blue run, I come up with what I think is a pretty good plan. I have decided that one of the reasons I keep falling is because it's taken me too long to get down the hill. So I think to myself, maybe if I can just find a straight line <laughs> down the hill, then I would fall fewer times. Which I quickly learned why you go back and forth <laughs> when I'm down in North Dakota. And so we're going, and I find this straight little pathway, and uh, I hit it right kind of going in between these moguls, and I am going farther than I've ever gone before. Like, this is working for me. I'm getting great distance. I'm also picking up a lot of speed very <laughs> rapidly. However, I'm still doing pretty well. And so I think to myself, I wonder if Barbie is noticing me. So I remember looking to my left to see if she could see me. And I don't remember for sure if she was. It happened very quickly. I remember turning back just in time to find, I think, the largest mogul on the mountain right in front of me. Like, this mogul was bigger than any of the hills in North Dakota by, by itself. <laughs> And I hit it square on, and I am launched in the air. <laughs> now, this looks really good on television when they keep their skis below them. <laughs> but I was flailing, and I was, I was off to the side. And uh, I landed right on the second largest mobile in the mountain. And I broke my, broke my left shoulder. Uh, I found out at that moment that Barbie was watching because she was the first one to come over. Uh, help me, and then ultimately skiing down the hill to uh, call for help. <laughs> so I broke my shoulder. I was done skiing after just a couple of hours on this week -long, weekend long trip. And uh, the rest of my senior year, I, uh, I had my left arm uh, in a cast, or at least in a sling. And I learned a lesson. Um, number one, um, I eventually married uh, Kim, so <laughs> Barbara didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> 
for a moon. That wasn't quite going to work out for me long term. But here's, I think, the, uh, the bigger lesson that I learned. That when we lose focus, that when we become fixated on the wrong things, rather than where we're going, when we start looking at other things around us, it often results in disastrous outcomes. There's a statistic that I'm absolutely fascinated with. And the statistic is this. That in America, 72% of us experience financial related stress. 72% of Americans have financial related stress. Most of us experience it as well. And the thing I find so fascinating about this statistic is that we live in one of the wealthiest nations in the history of the world. We're all cared for. We all do just fine. And yet for some reason, seven out of every 10 of us worry about money. Why is this? It's a very interesting topic when you start to think of how much the rest of the world lives on and how much we have as Americans. Why do so many of us experience financial related stress? Well, as I kind of mull this over, I'm, I'm starting to realize, I think the reason that so many Americans, the reason that so many of us even, experience this stress is because we're focused on the wrong thing. We become fixated on something that we think money is going to bring us, but it never does. We are convinced that money is going to bring us happiness, and we are convinced that money is going to bring us security. Two things that it almost will never, ever bring to us. And so what happens is, we're living over here with our, our means, we're living within our means or with our income, and we keep thinking, well, if I made this much more, I would be better off. My life would be better, I would feel more secure. And inevitably, likely, often, sometimes, we eventually start making this amount of money. And you know what? We're not that much happier, and we're not that much more secure. And so we think, oh, it must be over there. And so then we search, we reach for this income, or this network, and we reach it, and we realize, hmm, you know what? I'm not all that much happier over here. I'm not all that much secure over here as well. And so we keep chasing, we keep getting worried and stressed, thinking that we don't have enough, and then happiness and security are found just a little bit beyond our reach. 31% of millionaires, net worth one to five million, 31% are content with their net worth. 55% of millionaires do not define themselves as wealthy. Like one to five million dollars net worth and they're still not happy with what they have? Like money is never going to bring the happiness that we think it's going to offer. We're fixated on the wrong thing. Ultimately, I think, that we find the most fulfillment in our lives not when we constantly pursue money or possessions or any self-centered pursuit. But the most fulfilling things we can ever do with our lives is give it away to someone else and begin helping and serving and living unselfishly. Living other-centered is the best way to find fulfillment and happiness in life. The very opposite of where the world and everyone else is looking for it. I, uh, I first learned this from a, a guy named Leo Mabota. Uh, many of you know him, he blogs at Zen Habits. Uh, I often credit him as probably being the most influential blogger in my life. Whenever I want to make a change or think about how to do something, I look at what Leo does, and uh, it's worked for him, and it's uh, worked for me, and I uh, appreciate it very much. He uh, was very helpful to me in, in early on in my, in my blogging career. Um, I came home from a, an amusement park trip. I'd taken about 50 or 60 high school students to an amusement park in Boston. And I, it had been an early morning. I got back late at night. It was maybe close to midnight. 
And um, as I typically would do, I thought, well, I haven't checked my blog stats all day. I should, I should probably check it. This was just a couple of years after I got started. And I hopped on my website, and I the numbers were like this many page views. And then one, like that day, it was like way super high. I'm like, what in the world happened today? It's like in the thousands compared to the 20 to 30s that I normally had. And uh, you know, WordPress tells me that Leo had written a blog post about minimalism. And at the end, he said, if you want to know more about minimalism, go check out Becoming Minimalist. And all this traffic started flooding. A little later on, when I wrote my first book, he uh, sent me an email and said, hey, I want to read your first book. He wrote this beautiful review on his website and uh, sent a, a bunch of people to buy it. And I often credit him as being probably one of the most important reasons, one of the most significant factors in my success in blogging. So years later, I wrote him an email. He said, hey, I don't know if I've ever properly thanked you for what you've done and how helpful you've been. And I kind of listed these two things. I don't know if you remembered them, but I just want you to know that, that I'm doing what I'm doing because, because you did this. And he responded in typical Leo style in about one sentence. And uh, he said, if I have helped you in any way, I am happy. If I have helped you in any way, I am happy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's it, right? Like, like this is happiness. That this is where we find it in helping other people and all of the positive psychology studies, which is actually very interesting. It's about a 20-year-old field. Um, for most of our, most of the generations and most of history, psychology has been about what's what makes people wrong. And so just in the past several decades has been what, what makes life right, you know, what brings happiness and what brings fulfillment. And in every single study, like generosity pops up and volunteering and living for others. And the benefits are we find greater fulfillment, we find greater satisfaction, we find greater physical health. They find that people who are generous live longer, they're more confident, they have greater self-awareness, they have greater self-purpose. Additionally, those who give, those who live their lives for others, not only find all these positive benefits, but I begin to realize that they begin to counter most of the negative effects that wealth has on us. Which I think is also a very fascinating conversation. Most of us think about the, the dangers of poverty and how, uh, what the temptations when you don't have any money, but very few people talk about the negative influence that having money has on us. Things like isolation, and loneliness, and lack of empathy, and pride, and arrogance, and materialism. All these negative things that wealth has on us, we don't think about, we assume it's not happening to us. When we give, when we become generous, we begin to counteract some of those, some of those things. Which makes me wonder then, uh, how come more people don't do it? Uh, like, how come more people aren't living selfless lives? If, if, all the, if all the evidence points to this, if our hearts point to this, if all the research points to the fact that when we live for others, we experience better things, how come more people don't do it? Sitting Bull said it like this. Generosity is ultimately an act of bravery. Generosity is ultimately an act of bravery. Isn't that true? I think so many times we're, we're not generous with our money. We're not generous with our time, with our talents. Because why? We think that we need it. That if I start giving money, I'm not going to have enough for my needs. Generosity is a mark of bravery. Ultimately, not only do we find happiness, in giving, in living selfless lives, we also find security. That maybe the most secure thing we can ever do with our lives and with our money is give it away to someone who needs it. How can this be? Number one, how can this be? Um, the first thing I wrote down is, number one, uh, there are two places that we can find security. Margaret Clark, a, a professor of psychology at Yale, she says there's two places we look for security in life. We can either look for security in money and possessions, or we can look for security in relationships. And she says whenever we highlight one over the other, the other one starts to fade. And so when we constantly look for security in a bank account or in a certain size house or a certain income, 
And we stop looking for it in relationships. But as we begin giving, as we begin living with less, we naturally begin looking for security in these relationships, which I think are far lasting and far longer. Another reason that I think we find security and generosity is that our view of the universe completely changes. Uh, Anthony mentioned it uh, briefly, but um, last fall we signed a, a book contract to write uh, two books and um, ended up signing for more money than I ever thought someone would pay me to, to write a book. And meanwhile, I'm, I'm, I make enough, like I, I sell enough books already, and uh, we, don't, we don't need a lot. We live on about 5000 a month is what we think we can live on our family for. And, so this, this new money comes um, our way. I'm talking to Kim. I'm like, what, what should we do with the, with the money? And, uh, and we decided that, that we would do something meaningful, that, that we would start and found a, a nonprofit organization called the Hope Effect to literally change how the world cares for orphans. Um, I'm moving away from this institutional, traditional orphanage and, and one that focuses on, on family solutions. And um, as I, we're making this decision, we decide, okay, let's, like, let's do it. Like, let's do this. This sounds like the best thing we can do. I'm talking to my sister. And I count people, you know, pay down your mortgage, invest in your business, right, save it, retirement, all these things. I'm talking to my sister, and uh, she's like, what are you do with the money? I'm like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go help children find families that don't have parents. Like, how amazing this is going to be. I said, what do, you think I sh- what do you think I should do with it? And my sister says, you know, if it was me, I probably would have saved for my child's college. And she said that, and I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's actually a pretty good idea. Maybe I should have thought about my child's education. <laughs> And I, I just responded with the first thing that came to my mind. And I said, but Jana, do you really think that if I invest my money in providing parents for children around the world who don't have parents, do you really think that if I start taking care of orphans worldwide, that when my kids reach college age, that there isn't going to be enough money for them to go to college? Like, I just refuse to live in a world, I just refuse to live in a mindset, I refuse to live in a universe that says, if I take care of kids who don't have parents, that for some reason my kids aren't going to find education. It's going to turn out. It's going to be okay. Look, I can't tell you what you do with the open spaces that simplicity provides. And ultimately that's the best thing about simple living, is that it opens up resources, it opens up time and money and energy and focus. And I can't tell you exactly what to do with that, but I just want to make the case that I think if you replace material possessions with just other selfless pursuits, that you're falling short of the real fulfillment and the real security that you can find in life by using your open spaces to take care of others. I think we need to dream bigger dreams with our lives about what we can do, what we can accomplish. And we need to wake up and start realizing that. I have a a friend, his name is Mark. He's got a daughter who's 10 years old. Uh, His daughter was um, saving her allowance money, any money that came in from birthday, she's kind of a saver. And uh, so she had this little nest egg, and um, uh, they saw this ad that this farmer was um, giving away some dogs, uh, some puppies. And she said, I, I think I want a puppy. They're like, well, puppy's kind of a big commitment. Let's, let's at least go look. So they drove him and his 10-year-old daughter. They went, and they went to this kind of run-down farm, small town, Nebraska. Uh, dog had some puppies that they were giving away. And they kind of looked at him and just kind of talked to the farmer. What's it take? To, it's going to be to take care of it. OK, thanks. We're going we're to go back and think about it. So they go back home. and. Um, him and his wife were talking, they said, look, like, a puppy's a pretty big commitment. I think we need to make sure our daughter has some skin in the game, right? Like, let's make sure she's really serious about taking care of this, this puppy. And so they said, look, if you give money to the farmer, if you take your own money and, and buy the dog from the farmer, then we'll get the puppy as a family. They said, why don't you go think about how much you want to give him? 
So the little girl went upstairs and she came back down. And, uh, she had like $200 saved. And uh, she said, I, I think I want to give the farmer $100 for the puppy. <laughs> My friend Mark was like, whoa. Just in his head. Like, the dog was free. <laughs> give him $100. Let's slow down here a little bit. And so, and so he said, well, that's, that's very generous of you. But why don't you, let's think a little bit harder about how much, how much you want to give. And so he said, why, why don't you go think a little bit more if that's really the amount you want to give. He said about 10 minutes later, she, she comes back down and she said, I, I've changed my mind. And Mark said, uh, what do you want to give him now? And she said, I think I want to give him all to him. As I think about generosity, and as I think about giving, and I think about living selfless, other-centered lives, I've come to the realization that the more we think about it, the more we dwell on what that offers us and what that can give to us, the more generous and the more giving we become. As we talk about this and focus on it, it becomes something very attractive to us. And so as we go through this week, well, number one, as you go through your life living simple and living simply, I just urge you to constantly be thinking about what does this mean for other people? If I'm living less for myself, what can I offer to others? And then how about just for the sake of this weekend, even? Like, let's let that be the culture here. Like, let that mark our weekend together and our conversations. Certainly, we just heard what everyone has to offer, and there's time and space for, gosh, I really need what you can have. Can you help me with something? But maybe the, um, the mark, like maybe the, the first thought we should be in every conversation is how can I give myself to you? How can I help you in what you're trying to do and what you're trying to be? That's uh, just an opening challenge for the, uh, for the weekend and something I've been thinking a lot about. So thanks so much for the uh, start of the year.